Coming up, a pocket check to beat the band. I get a knife right from my ancestral past, and we talk big cold steels. I'm Bob DeMarco. This is the Knife Junkie Podcast. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. To the show i had a couple of favorite comments this past week the first one is from mr ed dc 6 mh and he says hey i'm telling y'all the agent 001 is my favorite t kel blade yet thank you for doing this one with t kel it was too easy the pleasure is mine uh, that's a sidebar now the agent series are the industry disruptor i love hearing that uh the best fixed blade design ever god bless you all god bless america okay i mean okay this is one of my favorite comments because for so many reasons, put all sorts of wind in my sails. Uh, I obviously love this knife. Tim Kell and T Kell knives uh, were so great to collaborate with, and they did such a bang up job on the execution of this knife. And then all of the subsequent models coming out, you've seen me show off the uh, Agent 002, and we're seeing sneak peeks of the three and the four. We also know that Tomas has one coming out, the 007. So lots of greatness coming out of that line. Mr. Ed, thank you so much uh, for your for your kind words. Makes me feel really great and uh, disruptor. That's cool. Uh, next was from uh, Pavel Petrovic, uh, 6846i. And this one, this one made me feel bad. He said, I live in Serbia, Belgrade, and from this country, Michael Janich came to the USA. By the way, this was on the Michael Janich interview video. And he says, and it's a big shame that he never did create a small Spyderco shop. I'm a big fan of Spyderco, and what a shame I cannot find all this beauty here in the country that Michael is from. What a sadness. And man, you, Pavel, uh, you, you break my heart with that because I, I can feel that I uh, there have been times where there were plenty of things here that weren't legal. And I, I yearned for them just because not for anything bad. I just wanted to have them. And uh, if you're a big fan of uh, Spyderco and you saw that Michael Janich episode, um, well, let's just hope that um, Serbia gets a, uh, well, uh, I don't know what the knife laws are like, but obviously Spydercos are hard to come by there. Let's hope that changes. And uh, maybe, maybe I'll just, uh, uh, drop Michael Janich a little a little note and see if uh, see if they can get some spider coes into country uh, into your country. I don't know if that's I don't know I don't know, but I will mention it to him. Thank you so much, Pavel, for that comment, and thank you one and all for watching the videos over this past week and commenting. It was greatly appreciated. All that said, it's time for a pocket check. Let's get to a pocket check. What's in his pocket? Here's the knife junkie with his pocket check of knives. In my front right pocket today, I had the uh, Spartan Harzi folder. I'm going to put this under the under the big under the knife cam and show it to you. Uh, this one I carried because I was uh, spent this past weekend uh, with some friends of my wives uh, of my not my wives uh, of my wife's, and uh, well, they became friends of mine too. Great people we visited uh, with with uh, the whole family, and they were awesome. And uh, the man of the house. Uh, well, let's just say he's like-minded, and I showed him a number of knives, and he showed me a number of cool things too, but I showed him this knife, and it really resonated with him, um, so I, I don't know. I just felt like carrying it today, and I love the Spartan Harzi. You know how great this is. Cut a bagel with it today and uh, opened a box with it today. That's about it, so not hard duty. I could have done that with uh, my keys. Uh, it would have been a struggle with the bagel, but it's still nice to use such a, a luxury item, not just luxury, but super well-built item for uh, everyday carry. So I love this thing. And of course, you know, it's got sentimental value with uh, the Curtis Iovito. Um, what do you call it? My logo in there that Curtis Iovito uh, did for me after I had him on the show. So uh, greatly appreciated. My slip joint today in my front left pocket, pretty much all day, right under the cell phone uh, is the slip joint from american blade works i think that's pretty much all they're still calling it the american blade works slip joint uh very very deeply ground 
hollow ground, uh, very thin behind the edge. Sheep's foot blade here. And how long is that? It, this is the perfect size for in-pocket carry without a slip. Uh, because if it rides horizontally in the bottom of your pocket, which is a huge pet peeve of mine, it's still short enough that you don't really it it doesn't really straighten out around the bend of my front thigh anyway. So let's see. Overall, I know in the slip joint world they they like the overall measurement uh, about five and five and three quarters, but that blade there is two about two and three quarters. Uh, great size. What an awesome knife. It, it's a great companion to the model number two from American Blade Works, a one-man band just making magic with all of his machines uh, down in North Carolina. And this, for his very first slip joint, has awesome walk and talk, just great action. And it's magna cut, so really excellent blade steel, hardened to 63, 64, I believe he has said in the past. So Really happy to be carrying that. Another one I'm very happy to be carrying. Haven't carried this in a while because, you know, my fixed blade carry recently has been dominated by the uh, Nova 2 and the Agent 001. <laughs> so uh, today I, I just carried something different. I had the pocket rocket on me from uh, Auxiliary Manufacturing. This one I carry in appendix, even in the summertime. It just, it's small enough and fits. And oddly enough, that straight shape from from the tip of the sheath to the pommel here uh, just fits perfectly in my uh, appendix on the right side kind of fits that fold when you sit down just perfectly and leaves you just enough sticking out out of the silhouette of your body to grab and use this is a great um double edge three inch dagger blade i love the blade it's incredibly done hand hand ground beautifully done by uh michael jarvis but i absolutely adore the handle of this look at this thing in cross section it any way you turn it it's faceted and scooped so you can pinch it and pull it pretty much any way sideways for a for a more uh, a ring dagger uh, downward stab or um this way and pinch it the uh, ordinary way for a, for a regular uh, picault or a reverse grip like this. Love this knife. Um, you, could, of course, could carry it in reverse, not reverse, in at the three o'clock and then draw it, do that, do that cavalry grab. Um, but this, I like to keep up front. This is one of those ones where you lift the shirt, pull it out, and go for the face. I love this little knife. And I have the Pocket buoy by uh, Michael Jarvis and Auxiliary Manufacturing. They do superlative work. I'd love to get more. <laughs> All right. Lastly, for emotional support, my emotional support knife, my ESK today was the awesome The Benny from Jack Wolf Knives. This is, of course, the, uh, the Benny's clip in, in locking, flipping mode so it's a little about a quarter of an inch longer on the blade than the benny's clip but uh the same overall shape just turned into a front flipper and a bolster lock so very very nice this this is such a great knife i i've always loved the tony bow's lanny's clip and then which uh is what this is a riff on and then uh, ben belkin and jack wolf knives came out with their benny's clip which was, which is still one of my very favorite slip joint knives. I even dyed the micarta maroon. Um, and then after uh, putting out some other flippers and modern folders, they came out with this and I love it. I love it. And it's one of the few Jack Wolf knives I have with the fancy, bright, colorful um, carbon fiber. And I really like it for a change. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the natural materials and the titanium and the micarta but every once in a while a nice carbon fiber like this comes along and uh, it just steals your heart that is uh, called lava no no not lava mars valley carbon fiber great name mars valley all right this is what i had on me what did you have on you drop it in the comments today uh down below and let me know it's always a pleasure finding out what you uh what you people what you people what you all carry and uh i love it Tell me. Let me know. Uh, here's a reminder. The Ultimate Steel uh, is ending soon. The Ultimate Steel is the Knife Rights uh, annual donation drive, but it's not like your ordinary donation drive. Uh, you just uh, 
you can donate just uh, a cup. You know, you can just do a straight donation and give them money and they will send you a knife as a thank you gift. Uh, or you can do special bidding and bid on uh, and and donate to get very specific prizes. They have over $50,000 worth of prizes, uh, including custom knives, including uh, custom made rifles. There's a Ruger Mini 14 in there I'd love to get. Um, but that's just a my my 18 days taken over. Uh, lots of other really cool things. I'm not sure if they have travel this year, but in the past they've had hunting trips, all sorts of stuff you can win from supporting knife rights. Knife rights is the organization that has changed uh, antiquated knife law in over 35, I think the number is 38 now, 38 states in the nation. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the work in Virginia is some of the chief uh, among all that. Uh, there was a period of time where we couldn't, long period of time where we couldn't have switchblades, couldn't buy them, couldn't sell them, couldn't manufacture them, export them, import them, anything. And now you can do all of that, even carry them concealed. That's right. Automatic knives concealed in the state of Virginia, thanks to Doug Ritter and Knife Rights. So please go help support um, Knife Rights and and do it through the ultimate steal. Uh, do it now while it's still up. I think it's only up for two more weeks. And I'll tell you what, um, you're not going to have an opportunity like that the rest of the year. They'll have another one next year. But, uh, you know, if you want your own custom knife through this or your own rifle or whatever it is, go check out the ultimate steal. Also, uh, just as a note, if you're watching this the day this drops, um, Doug Ritter will be on Thursday Night Knives tomorrow night to talk about the ultimate steal. Uh, if you're not watching it on the day this drops, disregard everything I just said. All right, lastly, before we get to uh, Knife Life news, got to talk about the Nova 2. The, the one and only, the beautiful Nova 2. Uh, check the pre-order. It is up now. This is my collaboration knife, my second collaboration knife with Matt Chase of Hogtooth Knives. Our first collaboration was, was based off of his EDC Tonto, which shares the handle contours of the knife you see before you. On, on the uh, first Nova, the Nova 1, we put a Bowie blade of my design on his EDC Tonto frame. Uh, this is the second in that line, and we changed the blade to a Kiridashi blade. We also changed the exclusive scale set to Ivory G10. I know it looks like blown out white from my lighting, but it's more of an Ivory G10, like a chiffon white or cream. And uh, it's got red liners there, and then a beautifully, deeply hollow ground, uh, steeply pointed Kiridashi blade of 154 cm blade steel you got jimping on top you've got a, an amazing grip and this one is really excellent for concealed carry uh, i like to carry this one appendix style it's very comfortable especially with the curve here that uh, kind of matches the curve of my belly and uh, i suspect yours too or uh, a a very comfortable carry of this knife also is in the three o'clock position uh, something I talk about a lot for um, in the waistband carry of fixed blade knives is a shortish handle with rounded features. Um, if if you're in any way uh, carrying a, a spare tire that you're not fond of or whatever, just a little extra around the midsection, a handle like this is kinder. Um, so that's a 3.75 inch blade, super, super thin, super sharp, and just a beautiful workhorse and a deadly self-defense knife if needed. Comes in a great sheath. The only thing we're changing from this prototype here is uh, the sheath is going to be um, charcoal gray. And we are going to have this larger DCC clip on it, larger than the last, than the Nova one. Also, on this one, we're doing a special thing with the special, with the serial numbers. Uh, we will have whatever our, uh, whatever our um, pre-order ends up being, if... Uh, 20 people pre-order this knife, it will be whatever number out of 20. Some people are choosing numbers that are above 20, and I will do that uh, for you because I love you. All right, so that is the Nova 2. Be sure to go to uh, store.knifejunkie.com and check it out. Store.knifejunkie.com will show you uh, the Nova 2. It will show you also uh, plenty of other things. There's a link through to TKL Knives for the Agent 001. So, Go over there. It's super awesome. All right. 
Uh, next up, we're going to do Life Knife News. But before we get there, uh, let me just... Let me just urge you that if you want to help support the show financially, a great way to do that is to go to Patreon. Uh, when you do that, um, you can be entered into monthly drawings for knives that, that we give away here on the third Thursdays of the month. Uh, but we have three different tiers of support, and you can check it out at thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Um, and... This month, it will be on August 15th. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the Gentleman Junkie Knife Giveaway of August, that's not this month, but next month, will be on August 15th, a mere two days before my birthday. So we'll be doing that. Oh, that's awesome. That means my birthday's on a Saturday this year. Excellent. All right, so do join us then, uh, but uh, be sure to check out Patreon if you're interested. All right, Knife Life News coming up. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super-sharp, crenulated bezel, and a built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch, theknifejunkie.com slash shockwave. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast, and now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. For the first time in a long time, Benchmade has something kind of cool coming out. I mean, I saw this and I was like, oh, that's interesting. There's only one little gotcha detail that might grind in your in your gut when you hear about it. But we'll see. To me, it's not such a huge deal. But we're talking about the new Benchmade PSK. And PSK stands for Personal Survival Kit. And uh, it's not a whole kit. It is one knife, but it will be a piece of kit for your kit. And what is it? It's a beautiful all-terrain, heavy-duty folder. All-terrain must be their words, or at least uh, at least Ben Schwartz's words. Um, all-terrain folder. This is a 3.45-inch drop-point MagnaCut blade. I got to say, uh, that is a pretty handsome MagnaCut blade there. Um, or I should say drop-point blade. I like how the point is very central uh, to the, to the well, it's right down the center line. And you can gauge that by looking at, looking at those little pockets milled in the blade uh, that are uh, resting on a center line. And uh, this thing is pretty beefy. It's, it's a 5.33 ounce knife, or if you get it in the carbon fiber handle, it's 5.22, so you save a uh, you know, tenth of an ounce there. Uh, but, uh, what was it? oh, assisted open. That's the issue. It's an assisted axis open. Um, so you just, you just flick the thumb stud and it, it jets out. I'm not sure if you can pull the, uh, the axis back and let it go out. I think that's how they do their axis autos. Um, and then on the spine, it's got a spine side safety. So you can flick that forward if you're having a problem, you know, or you're worried it's going to pop open. I got to say the pommel is perfectly designed. I love the shape of the pommel especially for a hard use folder that you might have to use it in a downward stabbing motion. Um, you know, it's a perfect uh, peak to, to cap with your thumb. Um, I like the looks of it. I like the bolster, the G10 bolster, and then the G10 handle. Um, pretty much, I don't know, this is a pretty cool one. And um, I don't know, I'm digging it. Uh, for the first time in a long time from Benchmade. It looks like, incidentally, it looks like this one was uh, one someone's personal carry from Benchmade because you can see the edges of the clip are scuffed a little bit. All right. Uh, that will be out at the beginning of August. So next week. Next is from Civivi. This is a beautiful one. This one uh, uh, really caught my eye. This is a classically styled field fixed blade, uh, field knife, and it's called the Civivi Cloud Peak. Cloud Peak, interesting name. Look at that thing. That is beautiful. Takes its cues from traditional sort of loveless style hunters. And uh, that's a 4.6 inch Nitro V blade, full flat ground drop point, really nice drop point. Again, that's one of those things that I don't expect to say, but I've been seeing a lot of beauties recently. Full tank construction, which is uh, basically par for the course these days, uh, especially for fixed blades coming from Civivi. Black or green G10. I really like that smoothed out G10 as we see it there, contoured nicely. Or you can get it in that wood, a Jurobusha or whatever. I don't know how, how you pronounce that. I've even looked it up and had the computer tell me how to pronounce it, and I still uh, can't get it. Nickel silver uh, quillions. 
or a uh, guard, you know, with just the downward quillion on the edge side and uh, just a very nice overall look going into a leather sheath. Of course, they put that somewhat goofy uh, lanyard on that. I don't think it really goes with a knife personally. I think something like this would, instead of that fob, would actually benefit from something that you could wrap around your wrist or, or your hand, because presumably this is to be used in the field. Uh, but overall, love this thing, and it's available now. Uh, somewhat of a temptation. Maybe I'll check it out. All right, next up, this one is called the Boker Chuse. I think that's how it's being pronounced, the Chuse. It's a collaboration with Alexei Ponomarev, um, a custom knife maker and guy you might know from Brutalica Knives in Russia. <coughs> Excuse me, before there were issues with Russians using Instagram, I used to follow a lot of rough Russian knife accounts and Brutalica was one of them. Seemed like a very cool dude, had a, uh, a brand in a shop um, and uh, this is his latest design and sort of reminiscent of another design that uh, Dave of uh, of uh, OG Blade Reviews gave me, uh, also designed by Brutalica, and that is a folding. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong one. Uh, that is a folding. Um, what do you call it? Uh, dagger. I'm sorry. So this is uh, this is the next one we'll talk about from Beg Knives uh, on screen here. But the Boker Choose. Did I give you? Yeah, uh, the Boker Choose is a. Uh, really interesting knife because it's a dagger a folding dagger we don't see too many folding daggers this one of course is not a double-edged dagger and i say of course because there are not too many of these and then when you look at the contours of the handle of this knife and the broadness of the of the dagger uh, symmetrical blade you see that there's not enough room in that handle to hide the blade to make it double edge but a beautiful um overall profile in any case, it is a liner lock VG10, of course, single edged uh, dagger uh, opens with a flipper that hides behind that uh, that handle guard, which I love. I love that uh, feature. And you can wave that open just like the other Brutalica single edged dagger I've seen. You can wave it open with the Quillian and uh, this has a deep carry stainless steel liner lock 3.95 ounces and available the day before my birthday. I keep dropping hints. Uh, yeah, this will be available August 16th. I love the look of it, and I like how it's coming on the heels of uh, some of the other uh, more tactical Boker Pluses that have been uh, collaborations recently, like the one with Chuck Gadratis, the name I can't remember, though. All right, lastly, that handsome uh, little worn clip that you saw a moment ago the Beg Knives Microburst. This thing is cool because, A, it's from a storied brand, Beg Knives, uh, but also it's from two great designers, Rod Olson and Jared Von Otterloo. We've had Jared Von Otterloo on the show. Uh, JVO Designs, really great guy. He's he's done a lot of just stunning designs, uh, uh, lending his talents to a number of people in the industry, makers and manufacturers. This one here, I, it takes the cake. It's a great little tiny Warncliffe. It's got a beautiful 2.25 inch swedged Warncliffe blade there. Uh, it kind of looks like a Kiridashi with the up sweep of that straight edge. Uh, it's got a very low profile flipper that when closed, looks like a little knurled section of that curved uh, forward section. So uh, it hides right in there. You just pop it open. And then of course it's got a, a button. I don't shouldn't say of course, but it's a button lock. So it is not only a uh, fun to, to use and beautiful to look at, but, uh, but it'll be fidgety as all heck. You see that pocket clip. Uh, that is a beg touch with that, with that ceramic ball bearing uh, at the contact point and on standoffs. 4.3 ounces for this little knife, so I'm not sure if that handle is steel or titanium. It hasn't been listed yet, uh, but uh, or I haven't seen it listed. And there you go. That is the uh, Beg Knives collaboration with Jared Von Otterloo and Ron Olson called the Microburst. I think it's a little beauty, a little, little beauty. All right, we're going to go and, uh, and check out the one new knife I got this past week, uh, but before we do, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. You can hit that notification bell. You can uh, download 
the podcast to your favorite podcast app. Listen on the go. Listen while you wash dishes or mow the lawn. Don't forget to mow the lawn. And don't forget, tomorrow night's garbage night. So, well, for me, it's tonight. But for you, I think it's tomorrow night. So uh, be sure to get on top of that. All right, coming right up, we'll get to the state of the collection. Adventure Delivered, your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals. TheKnifeJunkie.com slash BattleBox. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. I got something I've been wanting for a long time, and then I thought it was out of print. I thought they weren't making this knife at all. And then uh, I checked in at, oh, excuse me, allergies. Checked in at uh, Chicago Knife Works, and lo and behold, look at what I found. This is the knife of my people. The Cinquedilla. Oh, oh, I love this knife. All right, I'm going to put this under the knife cam so you can check it out. It's pretty big, but let's try and fit it in there. I'll, I'll exchange the handle for the blade in a moment. Um, so this is the Cinquedilla, and Cinquedilla in Italian means five fingers. That's a, so that's referring to the width of the blade at the hilt. Now, similar to the Navaja, uh, the folding Spanish, giant folding Spanish knife, uh, there were there came a time in Italy, I guess this was in the uh, 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 15th and 16th centuries, where they could no longer, citizens could no longer carry swords. So they developed this big, <laughs> this big double-edged uh, five-finger wide dagger. And they have beautiful hilts too, uh, current, uh, uh, frequently differently shaped like uh, hourglass and other sort of shapes, but this was a civilian sidearm. So this was something frequently carried on the back. And it was something you went about town with. And it was a status symbol. It was a dueling weapon. It was, you know, a self-defense. Uh, and and the higher your station, the more fancified your chinquadilla was. And when I saw that Cold Steel made this a few years ago, uh, I, 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 I flipped and I wanted to get it. I don't, I don't know. I guess I didn't have the means at the time or whatever it was or got wind of it too late or something like that. And I'd always admired the Cinque Dias at the, um, the Cleveland art museum it has an amazing, well, it's an amazing museum, but it has an awesome, our, our arms and, um, armor section. And so you can see Cinque Dias there. And then in the, um, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, they've got an amazing, uh, armor and arms room and you can see them there too and i i fell in love with them um first time i saw them because they're so unique and then of course they're italian and and there's a historical aspect to it and um but let me show you this one uh because it's pretty outstanding it's made uh by the windless knife company in india same people who make a number of knives you're going to see on this upcoming list uh but some of the big uh, cold steels that are um well, like this and not super, super expensive here. Let me go to the main cam. This one is big. This is going to be a difficult show to shoot, actually. Uh, but look at that thing. Uh, so it's got 1055 blades, or I'm sorry, 1075 blade steel. It's got a beautiful, going back here, beautiful hilt uh, with sculpted uh, wrought iron or not sure what that is, some sort of steel, and then a beautiful wood handle with all these little studs in it. And that is like a little hand massage. Not only does it give you incredible gription, uh, but it feels good in hand with these little steel nubbins uh, coming out. You've got an excellent weighted pommel that keeps the tip of this light and lively because it's a big, big blade for a knife. This is 13 and something. I guess 13 and a half, almost 14 inches. Uh, she's a big one. Uh, but I have taken in the last couple of days to swinging this around, doing my Carenza, my knife shadow boxing with this, if you will. And it is amazing. Feels really great and moves uh, really well for such a big and broad and long blade. And that's because of the handle and how the handle is balanced and weighted. Um, so really, really nicely made knife. I got this at, like I said, Ch not Chicago Cutlery, Chicago uh, Knife Works. And this is the sheath. It's 
pleather. I think it's leather. It's I guess it's real leather. Kind of shrink wrapped around something. It's got a nice shape and a throat here with all that sculpting and a cool uh, thing so you can slip it in your belt. A little stud. And there it is. That is the Cinquadilla. It came. It's a little bent like that so i'm trying to get the trying to train the sheath to be straight because that's the sort of thing that could really uh, grind my just just get get under my skin so the cold steel chinquadilla is the first is the state of the collection knife and seamless transition the first knife in the big cold steel section so you don't need me to tell you any more about this but uh, look for videos because uh, I'm going to do some cut test videos with this. I think this thing is going to do incredibly. Look at all the fullers, by the way. Look at the fuller work in this blade. I mean, that's impressive, especially for a, a sub $200 knife. Um, I ow, Oh, my God. Damn. I just stabbed my pinky resheathing this because I heard my phone and it should be silenced and it distracted me. And... Uh, Mm, maybe the tiniest, tiniest bit of blood. So I own it. I'll never get rid of it. All right. So that's the first in the big cold steel line. Another one that's a, a, a an impressive and um, an impressive historical ethnic knife that I've always had a thing for is this. And it took me a while to get it, but I finally got the Chieftain Sax. I've shown this off uh, quite a bit, I guess, in the pa over the past year. Let me just get some of that oil off the blade. The Chieftain Sax. There are a couple of saxes that Cold Steel makes. Three to be, uh, so a few, I guess. Few saxes. They make this one, the Chieftain. They make uh, one that is really expensive, and then uh, which is a Scrama Sax, so a little larger. And then they make one called the Woodman's Sax, which is, I don't, I don't care for it too much, but it looks like a great all around outdoors knife. <clears throat> this one to me looks the most like what you would expect to see uh, on an Anglo-Saxon warrior or, or maybe on a Viking. Um, it's got kind of a clip point blade, right? But the edge is almost completely straight. So that's, that's something that I love about the broke back sax. It's like, it, it kind of boggles my mind. I can't tell whether it's uh, a Bowie or, or, or a, or a Warren Cliff or, or what. Um, but I, I love the shape. It's kind of a mysterious shape here. So this has a really nice rosewood handle. And again, you've got a weighted pommel, like every sword should have that, uh, that every sword should have, or a large knife should have to keep it lively in hand. And I'm going to go to the main camera to show you what I mean. What I mean is uh, something this large with a 13 inch blade could be very diff difficult to control and front heavy. But you put a big pommel on this like they do on a sword and weight it here. That means the tip can move around easily. You're not, it's not dragging around because it's so heavy because most of the weight resides in the handle. So a uh, really great balance and weighting of this knife. Uh, again, this is a great knife for doing um, Carenza, doing to, for practicing angles and all that. And I would imagine it would make an absolutely uh, wicked uh, um, all-around knife. Uh, you've, what I mean by all-around is like uh, work, <laughs> live, work, play knife, uh, shall we say. That's, it does have a rat tank tail or a, or a thin, um, what am I trying to say? A hidden tang. So uh, I haven't taken the handle off, but, you know, presumably it's about half the size of the handle. Um, but still, I imagine with that springy 1075 steel, it's going to be uh, pretty good to go. Very, very sharp. And I love this thing. The sax. It's about the same length as that Cinque D also. All right. Next up, we're going to head into the Bowie realm here and take a look at the no, I, I, at the uh, it's 1917. There we go. There we go. The 1917 Frontier Bowie. Now I have a whole bunch of big knives right over here on the table, and they're all they're all just barely hanging on to the edge. So 
if 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 they fall, you know what's going on. So this is the 1917. It is awesome. Frontier Bowie. This is another one made by Windless Cutlery. The first two were, uh, and this one and the next one were, and it has an excellent sheath. Let's start there before I take it off with the with the blued shape and throat here. And then it's got a removable frog. The one problem with this frog here is that this is attached to the frog. I wish that were attached to the sheath and then the frog attached to it with this kind of opening here. And the reason I say that is because <clears throat> I would love to just have it like this with that stud sticking out and be able to just slip it in the belt. Uh, I'm not so big on these kind of dangle carries and I do like slipping a Bowie knife in the belt. Uh, all that said, do I slip this in my belt? Do I slip big Bowies this big in my belt? Generally not. Uh, if I'm checking the house because I think miscreants may have entered, maybe I would. Uh, the handle here, like a lot of the windless cutlery knives, had kind of came a little bit tacky, um, kind of overloaded with finish. So I, I uh, took all the finish off base that I could with isopropyl alcohol, and that took care of the handle. Uh, beautiful blued handle here or a blade here. I love this knife. This blade is outstanding. It doesn't have a full tang, but it's got a channel tang. So it's a tang that comes through here. It's pretty thick anyway. It comes all the way to the end, and you can see how far it comes up here. They just cut a channel in the handle and drop it on there. So super, super strong. I consider it a full tang. And uh, you've got that awesome S, uh, dramatic S card, S shaped guard there it fits it fits almost now you say why not the trail master bowie why have you not shown that uh and i would however that's under 10 inches and this this is all about knives over uh 10 inches or over and um i you know i have a katana i could have shown i have other things i could have shown but i'm not going into the machete sword realm here these are just big knives from cold steel Look at that thing. God, I love this knife. This one I highly recommend also. 1075 um, steel. You're not going to break the bank buying it, but uh, as I've said many, many times, every house needs a Bowie. So why not get the, why not get that one? You're not going to break the bank and you're going to have it for the rest of your life. Uh, next up is the Cold Steel Western buoy and uh, this one here's the leather sheath on this just pretty generic nice leather sheath don't get me wrong i'm glad it's in leather i wish they were all leather you're going to see some a couple of kydex coming up not a big fan of kydex on big beautiful knives like this especially if they have a traditional feel and this one indeed has a tr traditional feel it's got that uh, v44 shaped bowie style blade it's got the the S guard that we know from the, say the Western style W49, the famous Bowie. Um, and it's got the hooked pommel here. So just a classic Western Bowie shape. You can see a similar shape in many, many other knives. Like I said, the Western W49, a little smaller than this, uh, but the same, same uh, overall contours. Baron Sons makes a number of versions like this. Um, and uh, of course, the uh, there's the uh, Ontario Knife and Tool SP. What is that? Ten has the same blade shape. So just a very, very uh, common, beautiful, heavy duty uh, blade, uh, Bowie blade shape. That's again 1075 steel and rosewood. I believe it's a rosewood handle. Again, overly stained. This was much darker, about as dark as this on the uh, Frontier Bowie. But it was so sticky. It's like they uh, they way overdid the coating on the handle. So I I really did have to take a bit of that finish off to make it to to make it comfortable in hand. And also, if it's if you sweat with this in your hand, you would get that red coming off. So took care of that. Hollow ground uh, bevels here. You can see that it's got a, a a pretty generalized finish. Not the greatest finish ever, but. Uh, for a rough and rugged full tang uh, 1075 American Western Bowie, uh, it'll do. And I absolutely love it. Super, super sharp. All of these, it goes without saying, all these cold steels are incredibly tough 
and incredibly sharp. I say tough. I'm speaking specifically. I'm not just saying it generically. Uh, they are excellent at heat treating all of their steels, whether they, whether it was taking the cheapest Chinese steel like 8CR, not the cheapest, but taking a cheap steel like 8CR 13 MOV from China. They maximize the heat treat and get the most out of it possible. Um, and that's the same all the way up through up to their 3V. So take comfort. All right. Next up is we're going from that sort of uh, utility Bowie, utility all around her that we saw in the Western uh, Bowie and the 1917. These are these are weapons. These are tools. These are for camp chores. These are for killing. These are for skinning. Uh, all sorts of stuff. These next two are for fighting. These are fighting Bowies. Uh, this is oh, I love this thing. This is a huge favorite of mine. Uh, this is the Laredo Bowie, and it's got this incredible leather sheath. I. I wish I had gotten more cold steels back in the day with these leather sheaths. The the uh, nachas, the next one I show, had a similar one. I just love it. Now it's all in Kydex, and it's fine. It works great, but it doesn't look as cool, especially with a knife with a wooden handle like this or faux cocobolo. But this is a um, some sort of, I don't even remember what the steel is on this one. Got it about 20 years ago, roughly. Um, maybe a little less in, when I lived in New York. And when they would ship stuff to this and they didn't really check their laws. Uh, but this is a great, great design because it's long and slender. Uh, it does not widen out at all from the um, Ricasso here, or I guess not from the Ricasso, but it doesn't widen out from the base of the blade. It only uh, stays parallel to the spine and then grows more slender and comes to a point with this zero ground swedge, giving you a diamond shape or sort of dagger right up front. So incredible penetration and thrusting uh, capabilities with this. Uh, on the Bowie, going to the main camera here, uh, the Bowie knife known for uh, this back cut. So uh, if you're fighting someone and you have a Bowie knife and they're coming at you with a knife or something, uh, you, you do this flick where you drop the, you twist your wrist, you drop that swedge, whether sharpened or not, you can do a lot of damage into the incoming arm and you're cutting, gouging. It's more like gouging, splitting and gashing with this uh, zero ground swedge. And when I say zero ground, I just mean uh, it, it doesn't come to a flat top like most swedges. It comes to a kind of a scandy edge, if you will. Uh, I put the I put the um, patina on this blade because this sheath, though I was just singing its praises, scratched the ever-living hell out of the blade uh, when I first got it. You can see echoes of that here and here. So I, I uh, at the time, I wrapped it in like paper towels and doused it in white vinegar and got a nice patina going because I knew it, I, I didn't know much then, but I knew I could get a patina on that. And I think it looks beautiful. It also makes it look old school coffin shaped handle is really really great because it comes to a pinch point down here at the guard and widens out so you can do a lot of slashing and chopping uh, motions with this without cent centrifugal force pulling it from your hand so uh, and by the way look at that sharpening choil yeah very very you sharpen this into a fillet knife very very cool knife all right next up is uh, probably my runner-up for a coolest fighting Bowie. And as I said before in a spoiler, it is the Natchez. Excuse me. I love the Natchez Bowie. I just wish I, I had gotten it earlier and got it with that beautiful black leather sheath with the silver stud. But, hey, you can't have it all. So the Natchez Bowie uh, is supposedly the Bowie shape uh, that uh, Jim Jim Bowie had on him. I know, Bowie Bowie. I'll switch back and forth. I'm not comfortable with either now. You people have made me, uh, uh, given me a complex about the name Jim Bowie Bowie Bowie. Uh, but so anyway, uh, this is purported to be uh, the sort the style of knife he had during the famous Natchez sandbar fight. It's a Musso style Bowie, and what a Musso Musso style is, uh, you can you can identify it from the from the shape of the blade it has an overall upward curve 
See that spine has a slight curve. It has kind of a continuous belly and a very, very sharp point for stabbing and thrusting. This again, like the Laredo Bowie comes to a, a, a zero ground edge here. So you could just deliver in, in the words of Lynn Thompson, devastating back cuts uh, while, while dueling with your Bowie knife. Now, luckily, most of us don't have to duel with Bowie knives. Um, for me, it doesn't happen, you know, that often. Uh, but when it does, I'm glad to have a sharpened swedge and uh, a handsome notches Bowie like this. By the way, I love the size of the guard here. And this, this here where the guard meets the sharpening choil and the ricasso here, almost acts as a Spanish notch. And a Spanish notch was something you'll see in some Bowie knives, a decorative, a decorative flourish down here near the, near the Ricasso that was theoretically meant to trap blades. But this one really could if you, were, if you were doing some sort of fighting and you actually were close and blades were going against blades or whatever, which seems highly unlikely in a... In a but, you know, you could still trap a blade right in that little section there so i've always thought that was cool i like the the uh, equal sized quillions on the guard nice big guard and uh, a beautiful flared coffin shape handle here this i opted uh, not to go for the expensive 3v but for the uh, relatively inexpensive what is it 40 30 40 34 stainless steel uh, a much cheaper stainless steel, but look at the slab. I mean, this is five sixteenths of an inch. It's a thick slab of steel. I'm not worried about it not not being three V because to me three V. I would get this if if uh, I would get that in three V if I were an outdoorsman and I was planning on using this fighting knife as a chopping tool in the outdoors. I don't see why else you would need this knife in three V. I mean, it's got a cable tang. It's not set up for that kind of stuff. It's set up for fighting and fighting only so uh you know 4034 steel will do me just fine love this knife next up i'm going to take a break from these fixed blades and talk about the one folder in this uh group and you know what that is that is the ever awesome espada xl story behind this is it's a modern interpretation with modern engineering and materials of the one of my favorite knives from history, the Spanish folder, the Navaja. Navaja was a large folder with a ratchet um, ratchet lock. So that meant the back of the tang of the blade, which is rounded, had little ratchets. Uh, so little serrations, little saw teeth cut out in it. And then there was a tab here with a cutout and each little tooth fit into the cutout and the cutout was springy here. So you could open it and would click, 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 click until it was open. And then it was locked open. And then you would lift the tab up and release the blade. Well, in this case, that tab, as you know, is a thumb stud. It's for opening the knife, whether you're using your thumb or you're uh, waving it or camming it off the, the seam of your pants. So this works very well to open automatically off the seam of your pants, but you have to have uh, you know, seven to eight inch deep pockets because this is a big sucker. That blade is seven and a half inches long. This has an overall length of, uh, I don't even know. Overall length of a lot. No, let's see. Uh, about 16 inches, 15 and a half inches. Uh, my very unscientific measuring. But in other words, it's a very large knife. But so when you hold it back here and the handle, it's about as big as the Laredo. Maybe even larger. Yeah, you get you get even greater reach than the Laredo. I mean, we'll say similar. Um, so this is a folder, and it's not as never ever going to be as robust as a fixed blade, but it's got the industry's strongest lock in the triad there. Of course, people will refute that and and argue it, but. It really is. We all know it. Um, and so this thing acts very much like a fixed blade. And you could pack this or the lighter version that's just G10 and not not all the fancy polished uh, aluminum bolsters and G10. It's just flat, uh, flat and very light. You could pack one of those in your pack and have a machete at the ready that only takes up the space of, 
nine inches. So you know me, I love my large cold steel knives, and this one is the largest of them all, and in my opinion, the most beautiful and coveted. So there you have it. Uh, three more here. This next one was a gift from my brother. You know, my brother always giving me awesome bladed gifts. Uh, he usually focuses on genuine historic uh, knives. Uh, this one is a reproduction of a historic knife. This is the cold steel rondel dagger. And the first thing you might see is it has that similar sort of uh, medieval studded handle as we saw on the Cinquedilla. Uh, this is from, uh, I guess it would be a little bit earlier from, um, well, actually, I, I'm not sure. I shouldn't say. But this is this was the kind of dagger that old school, and, and that's about as technical as I can get, old school knights in shining armor would carry. Uh, I have to do more research into this. Uh, but I, I follow a really great uh, YouTube channel that recreates battles between knights in armor, and they really go at it. And it's not LARPing. They're not, they're not LARPing. Uh, they're in these beautiful locations in Eastern Europe, and they, and they really act out these, these battles. And it almost, all, you know, it'll be a, a long, a broadsword versus warhammer, or, or, or poleaxe versus. Uh, you know, mace or whatever it is. And the guys fight. And what it always comes down to is grappling. They always lose their large weapons and they always go to these rondel daggers and uh, find places, chinks in the armor or spaces in the armor where they can jam these in to stab the guy inside the armor suit. We'll start with the handle. It's called a rondel dagger because look at the pommel and look at the guard. Uh, perfect. It's, you know how we talk about symmetry in knives? We talk about it uh, when we're looking at it in profile. But if you look at this in cross-section, it's pretty symmetrical. Uh, even though it's got a triangular cross-section on the blade, I'm talking about the handle. You could grab it any which way. It doesn't matter how it's oriented. And it will do the same job it's going to do. Because this is a thrusting weapon. You could also use, I, I'm imagining, you could also use this to to menace other small weapons uh, that are bladed with this triangular shaped blade. Uh, I'm not sure about that, you know, like a sword breaker kind of. But uh, in any case, we do know we do know that it accelerates at thrusting and stabbing. Um, so with that triangular point, let's see if we can get that to focus. With that triangular point, you have sharpened edges but they're they're only sharp enough that if you struck someone's say forearm with it it would split the skin it would split it it wouldn't cut it but it would do lots of damage but that's not what it's for this is really for like i said it's got that reinforced triangular point to just find a soft spot in the armor or in the um chain mail and be pushed in uh and generally sewing sewing machined in that's that's what i what it looks like a lot uh this handle here is wood and the sheath is also really really nice uh leather here and um again a a wrought iron shape and throat here all right next up here and second to last we have the jimmy slash chopper uh this one just made it in it's 10 inches long and man, the blade is 10 inches long. I love this thing. Uh, Jimmy was uh, Josh Belay. Jimmy was very, very uh, generous and gave me this. This is number 11 of the first run of competition choppers. It's made of 5 16 inch thick 3V. It's, uh, it, ha it lives up to all of the competition chopper uh, specs. So blade sports and competition chopping knives have specific specs they have to live up to they have to be 10 inches long convex ground and then there are a lot of other things that you want to do you want to have that swedge for balance you want to have the blade angle off the handle to accelerate the cutting much like a recurve would and uh and and so on and so forth here you have a um lanyard hole forward and backward on the handle and super contoured, beautiful handle, man. That grippy, grivery. It's very, very nice. 
So Jimmy was approached by Cold Steel. Well, Jimmy works for Cold Steel. Uh, he he does a lot of their marketing uh, or works in their marketing um, efforts, I guess I should say. And they came to him for a for a chopper design because he does blade sports. Jimmy Slash, if you're not familiar with him, he's a great dude. So nice. I love seeing him every year at Blade Show at the Cold Steel booth. And I've had him on the show a few times. Just a great dude. Um, but he is the cold steel man. He has everything and in numbers and duplicates. So very cool for him to get this uh, design made through them. Uh, I wish I didn't take this and abuse it. I took it and chopped. I can't remember what it was now, but it had paint on it. And it's really hard to get that paint off. So okay, a little bummed about that, but I love this knife. And it comes in this really nice sheath. It's not for wearing. It's just for, you know, for covering this incredibly stout and sturdy blade. All right, last up, last up here in my big cold steel knife lineup is the ridiculous yet practical Chaos Kukri. That has a cool sound when you pull it out. Uh, this is... From the Chaos line, and what is the Chaos line, you ask? It is, the, it is the Cold Steel line of knives that feature this cast aluminum knuckle duster in that uh, double finger uh, configuration. So two fingers go in one side, two fingers go in the other. It's very comfortable in hand. And you can, you can really lay into stuff with this because if it's my medium-sized hand, I know it fits big hands pretty well. Um, and you really have a hell of a striking uh, surface here with all these ridges. And uh, and you know what? This would be a pretty incredible weapon. But if you were just to use this out in the field, D guards and, and hand guards like this really do make a lot of sense for non-weapon large knives too. Because if you're swinging around bushwhacking or uh, chopping, uh, you know, chopping it, um, what do you call them? Uh, little trees, what are they called? Saplings and you're in your chopping stuff down like that. This hand protection is a welcome feature. Uh, you can find it on a lot of um, Ontario and other machetes that come with D guards just to protect the knuckles while you're swinging it around. But of course, in combat, you want this to protect your knuckles, but also to smash with as an impact weapon. Of course, you've got this really beautiful Kukri style blade on it with that intense dramatic recurve and then the widening out you get a lot of mass up here for incredible shearing power it's a pretty thin blade it's it's less than uh, a quarter inch so i don't know three three sixteenths maybe um and it's got a very very nice flat grind i mean it gets really pretty thin behind the edge it's sturdy don't get me wrong sturdy and tough but you can do a lot of uh, heavy duty slicing slashing shearing chopping and and cutting with this knife and not for nothing here i'm going to go to the big big screen for a sec main screen you can use these great for stabbing just because it's a kukri and it and it's shaped like it has that odd downward shape you can still thrust wonderfully with these you can see uh you can see lynn thompson do a whole bunch of uh demos with that but if you can imagine you don't have to torque your wrist to get the point where it needs to be it's a very a very actually easily uh, achieved and easily aimed thrust with a kukri something a lot of people uh, don't know so that is it uh, hopefully not it i will get more and more and more i love cold steel i know you know that uh, but i also love the historical representations uh, the the way the living history through their knives so uh, as they come out with more cool ones i mean i've got a list i need those chrises i need that uh, filipino um the uh, Filipino uh, bolo that he made for uh, Danny Nosanto, Guru Dan, and plenty of others. Uh, but this is what I've got now. So thanks for joining me, and be sure to join us tomorrow night for Thursday Night Knives. And uh, if you're listening to this on the day it drops, we will be talking to Doug Ritter tomorrow. Looking forward to that. Also, be sure to join us on Sunday for a great interview, uh, as always. Uh, I'm going to thank Jim. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer.
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.